Hi, quite a few people on email and via Twitter pointed me towards this news article the other day, the Batterizer. It's a $2.50 gadget that extends disposable battery life by a whopping 800%. Sounds fantastic. Woohoo! And of course, it must be true, right? It's in PC World. And look at all these other news articles that are running with it. Look, Daily Mail, eight times longer. Eight times longer. Eight times longer. Eight times longer. Can you believe it? I'm 800%. Oh, whoa, 800% again. It's got to be true. A gadget that can make your batteries last 800% longer. Oh, man, this is fantastic. But of course, a lot of people smell... (laughs) Hmm, bullshit. Now, as Carl Sagan had with his baloney detection kit, I wonder if we can come up with our own electronic gadget news story baloney detection list. Let's try it. Let's go through and see if we can verify the claims of this thing because it's a real electronic product. It claims things like 800%. There's pattern, all sorts of technical information in here that, as engineers, we can go through and verify. And PC World spin a rather interesting article from none other than John Phillips, the editor-in-chief. It's a killer story of industrial espionage. The robbery occurred last October in the Batteroo office, the company who makes this batterizer. And, well, they knew the building layout or oh, breakthrough in technology that, if it's legitimate, could blow the lid off the alkaline battery industry that's worth $3.4 billion annually. Now, the first thing we're going to take a look at in our baloney detection list here is who is making the claim. Is it a big company, reputable people, all that sort of thing? Well, looks like they're a startup company, but look at this. Uh, This guy has, the guy who uh, found it, has a PhD in electrical engineering. Pretty good. He's a vice president at Broadcom, CEO stint at FlexPower, and, well, sounds pretty legitimate. And the next thing on our baloney detection test here is, well, does it break any laws of physics? In this case, we're talking about batteries, power. We're talking about conservation of energy. Does it uh, promise more power out than what you put in? Well, no, it doesn't. You read uh, down here that, uh, you know, once the battery voltage drops, it effectively becomes useless, etc., etc. It just has a boost circuit inside that boosts uh, low voltage up to 1.5 volts, and it uses the unused energy in your battery. And, well, this is a very uh, well-known problem with batteries and product design that this thing's solving. So, yeah, tick, no problems at all. It's not violating the laws of physics. So this is actually sounding really promising because there's nothing new here at all. Uh, There have been products to do this and also circuitry built inside products to actually do this, uh, like a boost converter to utilize all of the energy or more energy inside the battery. And they say it here themselves, there's no IP in the boost circuitry. Our technology is uh, the miniaturization technique that allows them to build it into a sexy looking sleeve which fits over. So it's all about you know the physical engineering of this really nice looking sleeve so it's all sounding pretty good right up to this point and if you actually go in here and have a look at their pattern that they've got they've got a couple of patterns by the looks of it this is the original one and it shows the drop in the battery voltage here a typical characteristic curve of for example an alkaline you know a sony or a duracell or an energizer or whatever uh battery and how you might only use a small amount of the capacity and if you go over to a data sheet of a typical duracell or alkaline or whatever battery you'll see that that characteristic curve and it's real so with this sort of characteristic curve if your product is designed to have a battery cutout voltage of say or 1.3 volts they're they're claiming 1.3 you know, 3.5 to 1.4, then if it has that sort of cutout voltage, then you can actually see how your amount of energy that you're using in your battery is quite small because the amount of energy in the battery is actually the area under this uh, blue characteristic curve here. So we can actually um, see that all of this in here is all of this energy under this battery is completely wasted. We're only using this amount of 
energy here. So it, it is a legitimate, well-known problem in the field. And that's what this thing overcomes. It uses a boost converter to convert the lower volt as this battery voltage drops. It actually boosts it back up to 1.5 so that the product uh, always thinks that the battery is good and it uses all of the area under this curve. No problems whatsoever. So here's our next step in our baloney detection list. How does Batterizer give your batteries eight new lives? Let, let's look at the assumptions that they're making. See if their assumptions are valid. Because if you base a product idea on false assumptions, well, it's going to be a useless or it's just not going to work as claimed. So look. Here it is. Once a completely new alkaline battery is rated at 1.5, but once its output drops below 1.35 or even 1.4 volts, it effectively becomes useless. Well, as an experienced electronics design engineer, I know that's not really true. I very rarely, in fact, I can't think of one example I've seen where the threshold, the dead battery threshold voltage, it would be 1.4 volts or even 1.35 volts as claimed here. But hey, we can go test this. Let's go to the lab. So let's do some quantifiable tests and take some random products that I've got lying around the uh, office here. And we're going to use an adjustable power supply, uh, battery power products. I'm going to replace the battery with some probes and we can adjust the voltage. We can start from 1.5 volts and we can wind it down until the low battery leg comes on. So I've got this Logitech uh, mouse here. We can switch this on. Okay, we've got our green LED on top, so it'll show, uh, it'll come up and flash or turn red when the battery voltage um, goes down. So let's wind it down. So I'm winding it down in 0.05 volt um, steps. So we've got 1.40. Nope, nothing yet. 1.35 is what they claim. You know, a lot of products. They don't say all products, but they say many. They use the word many. Well, we're... Still not getting there, 1. Oh, 1.2 volts. No, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Hold on to your hats. We're getting down towards a volt. Bingo, there we go. It's around about like 1.01 volts. Now, they use an example of a keyboard, and I don't know which one they use, but I've got a Logitech uh, K330 keyboard here. Uses two AAA uh, batteries, but hey, we can adjust our power supply now for uh, three volts instead of 1.5, do exactly the same thing. Well, look at that, even at 2.2 volts, i.e. 1.1 volts per cell, we're still working. Wow, even at two volts. We're still going, no problems whatsoever. This keyboard is gonna use a ton of capacity in that battery, well-designed product. I've got one of these little Zoom One handy recorders here. It's got a handy little battery bar graph on there, three sigma bar graph, let's wind the wick down. We have to get down to 1.25 volts before the first bar even vanishes. And we have to get down to about 1.1 one volts before it shows low battery. And I've got a Sennheiser wireless microphone here with bar graph. It has to get down to about 2.6 volts before the first battery bar graph goes down. So that's equivalent to 1.3 volts per cell. And it won't die until about two volts or one volt per cell. And let's try this remote control here. Uh, we've got the LCD display, but I'm also using a video camera to show the infrared LED here. Now at 2.2 volts, the LCD's starting to get a bit dim, so that's a bit of a problem, but the LED still works. This is still control the product. <laughs> it still works at one volt per cell. Thank you very much. Here's a much more advanced remote control. It uses four AA batteries. It's working down to one volt per cell. No problems whatsoever. Check it out. And this old school vacuum fluorescent display Casio calculator works down to 0.8 volts per cell. No worries. Even this Xbox controller works down to 1 volt per cell. Not a problem. Even an old school Game Boy works down to 1 volt per cell. What's this 1.35 volts? I can't find anything. And this multimeter still not showing flat battery at under 1 volts per cell. This old school Sony DAT Walkman, uh, it still works down to 1.1 volts per cell, almost empty. 
And this differential probe takes four AA batteries, still works down to about 0.95 volts per cell. Even this little thermometer thingy, which has no low battery indicator, but yeah, it starts to dim, but it's still working down at 1.1 volt, uh, 1.2 volts per cell. Yeah, you'd change it at that point, but geez, you know, it's not 1.35. So there you go, I couldn't find a single battery power product here in the lab that would drop out at their claimed 1.35 volts, let alone 1.4 volts, it's crazy, and I am not cherry picking here, I genuinely could not find a product, but hey, I know there probably are products out there if really badly designed products, if you search long enough, if you bought enough, you know, cheap ass $5 gadgets and you know, Bluetooth keyboards on eBay, you'd eventually find one that was so poorly designed that dropped out at the claim 1.35 or even 1.4 volts that it would be wasting most of this, you know, a majority, as they say, like, you know, maybe 80% of the capacity of the battery. I don't doubt it, but it's not nearly as prevalent as they imply it is. So right there, we've demonstrably shown that one of their main assumptions that they're basing their entire product on, their entire business model on, and indeed their entire patent, look, here's the patent that says that right in there. They're basing it all on this 1.35 or 1.4 volt battery voltage cutoff claim. The equipment is no longer usable. It's no longer usable in the product. Are you kidding me? Right there, off the bat, Gonski. And indeed, any product that's actually designed to use both rechargeable batteries and primary cell batteries must, absolutely must, cannot get away with it, be able to operate down to at least 1.1 volts per cell. That is the cutoff voltage for rechargeable products. That's why we saw many of our products there actually cut out at right on 1.1 volts because you don't want to let your rechargeable batteries actually discharge any further. So you're still using most of the capacity. There's a Duracell one. Here's any loop ones, uh, for example, the Senyo any loops. Exactly the same thing. You want these things to cut out at uh, 1.1 volts. The any loops are much better. They use mo like 95, at least 90, maybe 99% of their capacity down to 1.1 volts. That's why the cutoff voltage is around about that figure typically. So if you're taking the average of those products I tested there and ones designed for rechargeable batteries, you're looking at a cutoff voltage of 1.1 volts and look at how much uh, capacity you're losing. It's just this area under the graph here. It's not the huge 80% that they're running with and they're trying to advertise their product with. It, it is using all of this space under this curve. So you're only wasting about 20%. So right off the bat, their figures are completely back to front. Ugh, typical marketing. So this guy who designed the product and founded the company, he must know this. So he's effectively lying by not mentioning these things by omitting it and that's classic marketing 101 stuff because you know you can't get that 800 percent banner headline that then all the media outlets run with you can't get that if you tell the truth and actually say well yeah the majority of products uh, they work down to 1.1 volts you know no problems whatsoever anything designed with a rechargeable battery must work down to 1.1 volts so you know the headline that oh you get 20 percent improvement isn't nearly as good as 800%. No wonder they're not going to mention it. Next thing we want to do on our product baloney detection kit is actually test that banner headline. Can we do that? Of course we can. This is engineering. 800%. Where do they get that from? Well, let's have a look. Let's see you buy a new battery. You use it for a month. It drops to 1.4. It's now uh, ostensibly dead at 1.4. We've proven that's not true. But if you slip on the batterizer, uh, that's a two times increase in battery. You get another month's use out of it. And then if it drops to 1.3, boom, etc. And now they're saying there are now uh, there are more than eight 1.1 uh, volt steps between 0.6 volts and 1.5 volts. So in grossly simplified terms, the batterizer can extend battery life somewhere around a factor of eight. Grossly simplified? You bet your ass it's grossly simplified. In fact, it's worse than that. It's downright wrong. And why is it wrong? Well, let's look at this. 
This is from their patent. The time it takes for a battery to drop by 0.1 volts is longer at lower voltages versus at higher voltages. This means at a constant current was drawn from the battery, it would take the battery a lot longer to discharge from 1.2 to 1.1 than it would from 1.5 to 1.4. This means the extent to which the battery life is increased could be even higher. Well, okay, yeah, that is true. Look, it's steeper here, and then it goes like that, but then look, they don't mention, they conveniently miss out this like remaining 30% of the capacity here where it starts to drop down even faster again. So once again, they are effectively lying by admission. They're not telling you the whole story. They're basing all their claims around a very niche narrow scenario which and they're trying to put this out there as this thing is going to save the world it's going to be a multi-billion dollar business invest in us we're going to be you know fantastic this is such marvelous technology and it, no it's not it's going to have a very niche application because they don't mention the majority the vast majority as i've demonstrated cases where their assumptions are not true so the banner media spec of 800 times eightfold increase in battery life is based on a one like a very narrow window of products that I couldn't find, but I'm sure they are out there if you look hard enough that fail at like 1.3 or 1.4 volts within that sort of 1.35 to 1.4 in that sort of region. And then yeah, okay, they're probably right. You're going to be losing maybe 80% of your capacity under this. Uh, curve here, but that's also, they don't tell you that, it's going to depend on the type of battery. Here's one of these ultra power uh, Duracells, they they last a lot uh, longer, so there's not going to be as much um, a power lost as you'd get for one of a standard copper top Duracell, for example. And also their product claims to work down to 0.6 volts, and that's what they're, again, basing part of this data, this 800% calculation on. And 0.6 volts is quite uh, impressive for the circuit. Excellent, fantastic, nice design, I like it. But the whole industry, the whole electronics industry and uh, power and battery industry takes 0.8 volts as the cutoff voltage for a cell. It doesn't go down to 0.6. There's no capacity left. This thing, batteries drop off like a brick wall. And it doesn't matter what data sheet you look at. They all drop off like a brick wall at 0.8 volts. So having 0.6 volts and then including that in your calculation for your 800% for these 0.1 volt step, it, it, it's completely and utterly and demonstrably wrong. And another classic marketing technique, or well, get a reputable university to test it for you and then cherry pick some quotes from them so that you can you know, look like it's fantastic. Look, the device was tested by researchers. San Jose State University says it helps to prevent the voltage of a battery from decreasing under load. Well, of course it does. That's the whole concept of a bloody boost converter. And Dr. Parvin here, a material scientist, um, I'm sure he's very reputable, uh, and he says we tested the batterizer sleeve in our lab and we confirmed that the batterizer taps into the 80% of energy that is usually thrown away. Yeah, probably based on uh, the batteroo company's re recommendation that it's 1.4 so they're basically confirming of course they're going to confirm that but it doesn't matter because it's a bad assumption to begin with and i'm sure that uh, these uh, scientists at san jose university they you know they're no fools they know what they're doing but they're probably being taken out of context here i think they're just cherry picking the data that was hand fed to them in the press release from Bataru. And it doesn't help when the researcher says, uh, also confirms that 1.3 volts under low condition at that point, we consider it to be dead and throw it away. Well, it's demonstrably wrong. So I'm sure this uh, San Jose researcher is probably being taken out of context. I, you know, I can't believe that he doesn't understand that uh, electronics products are usually, uh, most, the majority of them, designed to actually operate much lower than that. Next on our list, beware of claims like this. The company behind the batterizer said it has tested the gadget with several battery-powered devices, including game controllers, look, this Xbox One, and TV remotes, etc. Well, wireless keyboards? Well, I tested it with wireless keyboards, didn't I? And it was just demonstrably untrue that they drop out at the claim 1.4 volts. So yeah, they may have tested the product in there, and it might work, in quote marks, but it doesn't mean that it gives 
any usable increase in life, let alone the banner spec of 800%. Now, you'd be thinking at this point that this thing is done and dusted. It's just not going to be even close to the claimed figures. And it might only work in some real niche application. Well, we can go even further and show how, when you look at the engineering of it, it gets even worse. Now, let's take a look at a typical boost converter chip that might be used in something like this. It's designed to go down to a low input voltage work off a single cell. Now, let's go down here and take a look at some of the efficiency versus output graphs and this one on the right hand side here efficiency on the y-axis here and then we've got the output current on the x-axis here the efficiency of this thing is going to change based on the output current and you can see how at really low output currents like in you know hundreds or tens of microamps like you might typically get in one of their example products a remote control well you're looking at like you know 50 percent efficiency some converters are even much worse than this this is a typical characteristic response curve of a boost converter like this if I go over to this data sheet from linear technology uh, for example then you can have a look at their efficiency curve look there's a big bump up there yeah you might get your 90 percent efficiency but only over a very narrow operational range of output current ie how much power your product is actually taking but once again it drops off down at the low output currents and your efficiency is going to change a fair amount based on your battery voltage as it drops you can see the blue curve here at 0.7 volts battery voltage the efficiency is a good 10 percent less than what it might be when it's up at 1.5 volts and what does that translate into in your final product well, let's assume that's only 50 percent efficient down at that point well your 800 percent claim even if you could find the niche product to do it and cut off at 1.4 volts you're still looking at losing half of your efficiency down at that thing unless you specifically design your circuit for a specific type of product you when you use a general purpose chip like this and you have to design a general purpose product to work over the range of any unknown product you don't know whether that product's going to be a wireless keyboard that draws a small amount of current down here or whether or not it's going to draw hundreds of milliamps right up here you just don't know so you've got to look at the efficiency and at higher currents it's just going to drop off like a brick wall so any potential gains that you're going to get from this batterizer based on uh, the dropout voltage of your product is going to be offset by the efficiency of this thing depending on what type of product you've got. So once again, it even narrows the range of usable products even further than what it already is based on their ridiculous, original ridiculous claim of 1.35 volts cutout voltage so let's say you found a product that well you could double your life if you use if you're only using half the capacity of the battery and this uh, batterizer can use the extra 50 percent of that capacity well if it's only 50 percent efficient then you're screwed you just you're back to square one and you're going to get exactly the same life out of it as you did with just using the regular battery and pissing away your extra 50 percent it's not going to help at all and the other thing to consider is the equivalent series resistance of the battery. Now, this gets a bit complicated, but look at this red graph here for this uh, Duracell Copper Top uh, AA. They don't actually show it extending out here, but the resistance rises as the capacity goes down and the voltage drops. And it's going to sort of like tail up like this as the voltage drops off like that like a brick wall it's going to sort of like tail up in the opposite direction and the exact effect of this depends upon the product that you're actually powering whether or not it's uh taking uh, pulse loads for example like high current pulse loads that's going to be a big deal where if it takes a you know your battery voltage might be falling like this but then if it switches on a motor for example then boom you might get a low dropout like that which may kill the product and things like that that depends on how much decoupling they've got internally and all sorts of technical details like that and is this uh, batterizer going to help in that respect I don't think a huge amount because it's physically not a large DC to DC converter it has to be like one of the world's smallest DC to DC boost converters in order to fit in this form factor so naturally it's going to have extremely limited output capacitance and uh, peak current uh, capabilities so you're relying on the internal uh, 
decoupling of your product to handle those uh, pulse loads effectively. Now, will the batteriser actually make a difference in this case? Well, it it may, but in the majority of cases, I don't think so because, yeah, it's boosting the voltage up to 1.5 volts, which is great for those products which have a low dropout voltage. But in terms of uh, peak current at end of life, for example, um, yeah, it's boosting up to 1.5, but there's going to be a corresponding increase in the current because you have to keep constant power output from your DC to DC converter. So the current from the battery is actually more and ESR plays more of an effect. So, you know, as I said, it depends on the how your product is designed and the decoupling. So, but mostly because of the physical size of the thing, I don't think it's going to make a huge, if any, difference at all. In fact, what they don't tell you is that the batterizer could actually shorten the battery life instead of increase. It depends on your product. So while they might, you know, you might be able to find a product which says, oh yeah, look, I double my battery life or even triple it or even quadruple it. No way you're going to increase it by eight eight times, but hey, you might be able to double it, but hey, you might have some other product where the battery life halves because of the particular efficiency and the design of the thing. And what's another downside? What is the maximum output current of this thing? They haven't told you. I bet you they're not going to tell you until you hand over your hard-earned money and find out, oh, it can't be used in my high-power product because it's only got a maximum output current of a couple hundred milliamps or something like that. So you can't use it in a toy that's uh, work designed to work with double A's and then, you know, you might have to suck an amp at peak or something like that. Your product could easily fail if this batterizer cannot deliver peak currents for example heck let's just take a standard copper top double a battery here if you've got a product that actually cuts out at one volts which was like a lot of the products that i just showed then well you're using already using like 90 percent of your energy and the best case efficiency you're going to get out of a dc to dc converter even if it's optimized is going to be like 90 uh, percent uh, sort of like at best so it's already a useless product right there and could actually be detrimental if you use it down the efficiency curve so they're not going to tell you that they're not going to tell you that this thing may actually decrease your battery life and you won't know that until you actually put it in and do the battery drain comparisons yourself and figure out whether or not this damn thing works oh man and take a look at the PCB, look at how much room you've got to fit the chip and the magnetics, i.e. the inductor, because you need an inductor in this thing. Here's the inductor over here. That's everything in this boost converter. And the smaller and smaller and smaller you make your inductor, they've probably got a tiny little 0402 or 0, you know, 201 uh, inductor in there. You've got to get really low profile in there. It's going to be a tiny amount of magnetic. The smaller your magnetics leads to a much lower efficiency the smaller it is and also limits your output current so how much output current can they fit in these things well my engineering estimate is not very much at all and they're not going to be very efficient either but they're not going to give you the numbers on this because that just ruins their whole marketing campaign how do you dissipate your heat in this thing well it could be quite uh, novel you could actually use the metal uh, bar like this as a heatsink. I'd certainly be using that, but then you've got to uh, make sure your chip is properly thermally bonded to your metal uh, package here to get out the heat, especially at those higher currents. Might be fine for low current devices like a wireless keyboard, for example. You put in one of those Xbox uh, controllers. It's got the you know the the transmitter and everything. It's got the vibrator motor, all that sort of stuff happening, or some other high power product. Ah. Oh. This tiny amount of space on here, at nut. There's going to be very severe limitations imposed on this product, and they don't give you that data. They just put out this press release with glowing, you know, numbers, and they just gloss over all these technical details. And then what about the quiescent current for low? current uh, products that aren't drawing much. Look at this. For this uh, converter, yeah, you can get better than this, but you know, this might be a typical figure. 300 microamps, typical for your active quiescent current. And that doesn't include your efficiency of the thing, which as I said, at absolute best, if you use it at the optimal part of the efficiency curve, 90% might typically be, be, you know, like 70 to 80%, something like that. So they can happily throw around marketing buzz 
terms like up to 800% improvement, all that sort of stuff. Well, from an engineering point of view, we can practically guarantee that there will be some products out there, I don't know how many, but there will certainly be some where this thing will have a detrimental effect on the battery life. They don't tell you that. That ain't good marketing. And if you take a look at a typical alkaline battery like this, the positive terminal on the top is all of this metal can. If this is still the positive terminal here, and the only thing isolating the positive and negative terminal is this tiny little gap, this tiny little rubber o-ring around the bottom. So you could easily get in there and short it out. You can probably see the little tiny spark. Whoa, there we go. Just generated some smoke. Woohoo! There we go, I made something smoke if you short out this negative terminal to the positive here. So if you take a look at the design of this thing, this whole metal body along here is connected to the negative tab there. So you're relying upon just the outer, uh, like, you know, mylar insulating wrap or whatever it is around the battery there to stop any spurs from shorting out between all this cut metal along here. I mean, it's any, there could be a tiny little burr on there and it could short through to the negative terminal. It's an accident waiting to happen. And they want to use this on like, uh, they're saying up to D cells. Are you kidding me? The amount of energy in a D cell is incredible. Let alone a double A is enough to ruin your day, possibly start a fire. Jeez, I wouldn't want to rely on a product like that. Whew. So there you go. That is the batterizer product that made all the headlines and basically hardly anyone, almost nobody in the news world wanted to actually think and verify this. And it's not hugely hard. Just ask any competent electronics uh, engineer and they would have been able to tell you this. I know I've taken 30 minutes to do this. I basically came to this exact conclusion in like tens of seconds after I immediately saw this product. I just knew the limitations that would be involved in this thing. It's obvious to any practitioner in the field, yet they're just running with all this marketing spin and they don't tell you any of the downsides. So that's why I've presented, hopefully, a useful product baloney detection kit here. You've got to look at the claims, uh, you know, look at their assumptions, verify the headline claims of 800%. It's not even close to that. And just look at the downsides of something like this. Don't just get caught up in the hype because it sounds fantastic and usually if it sounds too good to be true it usually is and while they're like technically right in some of the things that they say and what they're doing here and the product is going to work in some very specific circumstances and it may actually give an improved battery life but they don't tell you about all the downsides and everything else with it Wait, stop the presses. Um, since I finished this video yesterday, just overnight, they've updated their website. It was just coming soon, but now they've actually got some details here. It's one of these typical uh, slick, you know, one-page uh, marketing websites. And let's have look. Here it works. The most new batteries contain 1.5 volts of energy. Wah, right there, they're wrong. They just have no idea what they're talking about, energy and 1.5 volts of energy. That's just ridiculous. The problem is that many devices stop functioning around the 1.3 volt mark. Look, they use the word many. Many. Uh, yeah, how many? I couldn't find one here in the lab. Maybe I could if I looked a bit harder. But the majority of devices, as we showed, this is demonstrably not true that many devices do this. It's not. It's probably a small minority of devices, yet they're basing their entire product and everything around this stupid 1.3 volt figure and it uses yeah it lets you instantly tap into the existing 80 percent energy that's usually thrown away bullshit any device that uses a rechargeable battery automatically will must go down to 1.1 volts and and use probably you know 80 90 percent of your capacity more if you use those sanyo any loops and wait they've got a marketing video let's run it did you know that every dead battery you've ever thrown away had only used up to 20% of its battery life? Whoa, hang on, what did they say? Did you know that every dead battery you've ever thrown away had only used up to 20% of its battery life? That every dead battery you've ever thrown away, that every dead battery you've ever thrown away, that every dead battery you've ever thrown away.
Unbelievable! They've gone from using the word many to every. You heard it there. They're claiming every battery you've ever thrown away has wasted 80% of its capacity. Oh, this is demonstrably untrue. What if you could instantly tap into the other 80% that is still trapped inside? Now you can with Batterizer. When your batteries are running out of juice, just slip the Batterizer micro-thin sleeve onto your low or dead battery, insert it back into your device, and see your power level jump from low to 100% instantly. We tested the Batterizer in our lab and we confirmed that the Batterizer taps into that 80% energy that is usually thrown away. So I kind of feel a bit sorry for our professor colleague here. I'm, I'm sure he means well, but he should know better than this. He got duped into doing this marketing video for this company, and but even he admitted that he used the word usually thrown away. The 80% is usually thrown away, but that didn't stop the company then going to use previously in the video, just before him, say every battery. Oh... So as an electronics design engineer and product designer, I can't help but look at this thing and just go, oh, geez, it's just mostly marketing. And yeah, sure, it's going to work and give some extra output in, you know, maybe quite a few uh, circumstances, but probably not the majority of them. And yeah, it could work reasonably well in something that, uh, you know, is a marginal current uh, drain and it's dropping out at, you know, 1.2 volts or something like that. Yeah, you might be able to, you know, squeeze an extra, maybe up to, you know, 50% efficiency out of it. But then, you can't help but look at the efficiency figures like this and go, well, it's, you know, you're going to have some loss there as well. It's not going to be that great and all the different products and, oh, geez, yeah, it's going to work. And they can easily spin a demo for anyone and show that, oh, yeah, look, it just, you know, increases. I can find a product easily. I can whack this thing in and show that it works wonders and, you know, people will just... Uh, go wow this thing is just the most amazing thing ever it's going to revolutionize the world and well nah in practice it ain't going to revolutionize much i'm sorry and it's not even a new idea it's like yeah it's actually quite some innovative uh packaging and things like that they've done to get it in this sort of uh form factor and uh, things like that so i'm reasonably impressed by the engineering side of the you know the physicality apart from the uh shorting out thing of course that's a oh, man so yes, whilst this product can actually work and give an improvement, a measurable improvement in some products, some is the key word there. It's not going to magically work in all products. It's mostly marketing spin, preying on people's ignorance of how this sort of stuff works. So if you're looking to buy this thing thinking that it's going to be magic or if you're, heck, you're looking to invest in something like this, then, well, you've got to know all the story and they're not telling you that because, well, that's not good marketing, is it? So there you go. I hope you found that baloney detection kit useful. That is a, a bit of a step-by-step -step, uh, procedure on how to look at the claims of a product like this and the baloney detection kit might uh, change a little bit depending on what the uh, product is and what uh, specific area but something like this that's real easy to debunk using just a basic you know look at the engineering data so there you go if you want to discuss it if i missed anything or or you think that i'm wrong and it actually uh, might work better than i'm making out then leave it in the comments down below catch you next time